Okay, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Zijie Wang. Uh, she got a PhD in mechanical and aerospace engineering from the State University of New York in Buffalo. She is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Wisconsin Madison and currently she's a research scientist there. And uh, she's also an active member of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. So she's here uh, today interviewing for a position in mechanical engineering. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and talk about my research uh, in cardiovascular cell mechanics. Um, first of all, because I want to impress you that cardiovascular disease research is important, I give you some statistics. So, as you know, one is cardiovascular disease one of the leading cause of crisis in the United States. Actually, one in every one in three people die will cause this crisis cardiovascular disease. And you can see that it's really 32% is caused by heart disease and some cause by stroke and cerebral vascular disease. And then there's also an economic effect of this disease. And four years ago, the total cost of cardiovascular disease in this country was estimated to be $444 billion a year. That including the uh, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. And every day, this country spends more than $1 billion on this disease. And it's estimated that by 2030, the heart disease itself would cause uh, heart disease cost would increase from 273 billion to 818 billion. So I think there's a pressing need in, um, for us researchers trying to find new tools to diagnose and treat the diseases so that we can help with both the, in the health situation and also in the economic situation. Um, so in my Today's talk, I would like to focus on one type of cardiovascular disease, which is called pulmonary hypertension, or PH. I want to use this disease as an example to show you how a mechanical engineer can deal with the health-related problems. So what is pulmonary hypertension? It is a disease of abnormally high blood pressure in the pulmonary arteries, <coughs> and usually the clinical definition is once the pressure is above 25 millimeter mercury, it's considered hypertensive. And there are different causes of pulmonary hypertension, and one of the most severe type of PH, which is called pulmonary arterial hypertension, or PAH, it is a very uh, fast progressive disease with 15% of mortality rate within one year, and you can tell the three year survival is already 50%, and there's no cure for this disease. So, the biomechanical changes associated with this disease is that if this is a, the whole pulmonary vasculature from the proximal end of the arteries, there's a stiffening of the artery, and then at the distal end in the small pulmonary arteries, there's a narrowing of the arteries occurs. So the combination of the stiffening and narrowing of the arteries would lead to an increase in upload to the right heart and that caused right heart dysfunction and failure. And actually, right heart failure is the main cause of death in the PH patient. So you can tell that this disease really involves all levels of, uh, of not dysfunction from single vessel to whole organs, such as lungs and heart. So my expertise is to uh, I think my research interest is to study the mechanobiology and biomechanics um, at different levels, from a single artery to a whole set of network of arteries, such as the lung, and then study how the interaction between the single artery and the, for example, the proximal artery and the distal arteries, how they uh, would affect each other, and then, and also, I would like to look at how the heart function changes during the vascular abnormality. And then we know that both proximal and distal arteries would have an impact in the heart dysfunction. So 
there's, this is an opening area of research to study how each um, type of arteries would contribute to the heart failure. So first let me start from a single arterial um, biomechanics. So the reason we look at the proximal arterial as a beginning is because from clinical studies there has been evidence showing that the stiffening of the pulmonary artery is a pre has a predictive power in the disease. So for example, in this uh, from this figure, it's from Stansi et al. in 2009 in humans. They have found that by using different indices of arterial stiffen stiffness index, um, they found that the stiffening is correlated with the severity of the disease. So it is, there is a, it's a good indicator of the, as a diagnosis in disease. And furthermore, uh, Gang et al. also found that the another uh, parameter that can measure the arterial stiffness called relative area change. It is an independent predictor of mortality. That means the, the stiffening of the artery is very important in this disease. So I would like to study how this occurs. Oh, I'm sorry. So first I want to talk about how we can measure the, in the, the arterial stiffness for mechanical properties in in vitro methods. So the traditional method is the strip test. And like shown here, usually we can harvest a piece of tissue and cut into a strip. And it can be into dog bone shape or not. And then it can be uh, we can perform the mechanical stretching on both directions. And uh, we can place the feet on it to have a straight mapping. So in this way, we can obtain the false deformation relationship in the tissue so that will uh, further quantify the mechanical properties. And here is a, a picture showing uh, a dark pulmonary artery that is mounted on uh, the two clamps in a photomechanical test. And then another method is called ring test method. Um, obviously, this time we don't cut the tissue into a small strip, but into a, a ring. And then we can mount the ring into two cannulas, and then we can really measure the circumferential mechanical properties. And the good thing with this <coughs> test is that usually the, the device can be placed in a, um, under a microscope so that we can have a, a imaging structure, uh, function structure relationship with also the imaging information included. And also because the rings can be expanded <coughs> in PDS so that we can give different vessel uh, active agents to alter the smooth muscle cell tone such as we can activate smooth muscle cell or cause it to relax. And so I just want to show you I have used a, a ring test devices um, to uh, place it under um, multi-photon microscope and um, using the so-called SHG imaging, which is second harmonic generation imaging that allows us to only image the collagen fibers. So these are the white, the bright part are the collagen fibers that allows us to see the density and orientation of the collagen. So this is only part of the ring and then we can inflate it and deflate it and then uh, obtain also the structural changes. And both method, both the two previous method, as you can tell, it's whether it's a ring, a strip, it's not keeping it really in vivo geometry and configuration. That's why I think the third method, the intact artery force inflation test, is the is the advantages among those because here we can harvest the, the a segment of vessel. We don't break down any of the geometry or configuration, then we can inflate it by pressure, and also we can stretch it longitudinally so that the, the artery is more under a uh, physiological uh, uh, force and also deformation. That gives us the, the best estimation of the mechanical properties. And with this technique, it's also compatible with microscopic imaging, for example, this is an early study by Zomei et al. 
Um, they, they are also using multi-photon image. They place the outer mouse arteries under um, the multi-photon image. And by different wavelengths, they can quantify collagen and elastin. And then they can put together back and then also compare with the histology. So I think the combination of the isolated vessel mechanical test with the imaging is a great tool to help us to understand more of the structure function relationship. And again, this method also allows us to test the vessel with smooth muscle activation or relaxation. And another great um, advantage is that this system can be compatible with dynamic testing because most of the mechanical test system, they are really measuring the static mechanical property. That means we give a constant force, pressure, or stretch, and then we measure the deformation. And then we change it, and then we measure again. And the, in my uh, research, and um, in the system, I, we can, uh, the system allows us to provide a dynamic change we can, which we can apply the sinusoidal waveform of pressurization that allows us to measure the physical elasticity, which I will in introduce later. And in, in vivo method, in human or large animals, we can obtain the pressure by right heart catheterization or tricuspid regurgitation jet. From, um, and the diameter or area change can be measured by various of medical imaging techniques. And in small animals, it's the same, at same principle. We obtain the pressure, we obtain the diameter. So these are the general ways to um, quantify mechanical property. So the way I uh, study the mechanical bio biology in stiffening artery, um, I want to give you more background about what has been changed during the disease development. So as you can see that these are the different, at the different locations how the arteries has been changed. It has the thickening of the medium wall, and then furthermore, in the more distal vessels, there could even be an intima thickening. We call it new intima formation that causes further obtrusion of the artery. And also that you could see this type of formation, uh, this lesion that is these are all the vessels. They form a cluster of vessels that really, uh, it's a pathological lesion that people name it called uh, plexiform lesion. So, and with all these cellular and geometrical changes, one big change is that there's an extracellular matrix or ECM accumulation during this procedure. And that is where, what my focus is. And particularly in the vessel, <laughs> I study collagen because in the blood vessel, collagen and elastin are the two major proteins. And it is also a, one of the, it is the most abundant protein in our body. So why I want to focus on collagen. So this is a very typical stress strain curve from an artery. And usually the curve has a J shape and the lower strain range is mostly uh, determined by the mechanical property of elastin because when the artery is stressed, stretched a little bit, it's the elastin that is being loaded. And when the stretch increases, then collagen more and more collagen fibers are recruited and then they bear the load, they, the vessel becomes stiffer and it's mostly the behavior of the collagen. And then the reason is we already, I already show you that the Stiffness is a good predictor for mortality. And from my group's previous study, we have shown that there's little changes in elastin during the hypertension development. And collagen accumulation is closely related to the stiffness of the artery. So that's why I want to further study how collagen contributes to the stiffening. So this is what my uh, American Heart Association post, uh, postdoctoral fellowship is are working about. So look at here, in the normal pulmonary arteries, there will be collagen fibers aligned, and then between each fibers there will there there are cross link form that that is very natural uh, natural uh, configuration. And then during the disease development the wall becomes thickened if you remember it's thickened wall and there is more collagen deposited and then more cross links deposited too. 
So then the question is, the stiffness of the artery, is it because of more collagen content or because of more collagen cross-link? So my hypothesis is that collagen content and cross-link differently affect the proximal PA stiffness during the pulmonary hypertension development. So how can I study it? So I'm using an animal model uh, with a mouse. I place a mouse in a low oxygen environment uh, for 10 days. And then I use a transgenic mouse that is uh, the mutation causes the um, mouse to be resistant to type 1 collagen degradation. And type 1 collagen is a major collagen in the vessel. And then I also give the, uh, a treatment to, uh, to the animal, which is called BAPN. That is an antifibrotic drug prevents, which prevents cross-link inflammation. So it's a little bit complicated. That's why I want to use animation to explain. So in my study, I would like to measure cross-linking and content in the vessels. So we have wild-type animal and the transgenic animals. And at the baseline, they were showing up pretty much there's no string difference. They're showing the same baseline. So the cross-linking and content are similar. So if we expose these animals to hypoxia, they will develop hypertension. And then both content and cross-linking will increase simultaneously. And if during that period I give the, the drug, remember the drug prevents the cross-linking. So, and the, the drug's effect is the same to both strains, so cross-linking would be reduced. And in the wild-type animal, Usually when new collagen, if they couldn't form cross-links, they would go undergo some recycling procedure, they will be degraded. So that's why once we prevent the cross-linking, the content is also reduced. So in this way, it's kind of prevent the, pre uh, prevent the stiffening of the artery. But in the mutant mice, if you remember, the collagen is resistant to degradation. So the collagen content is still high, whereas the cross-linking is low. So in this way, I decouple the changes in cross-linking and content so that I can study the individual effect of it. By the way, that's a smart word, so when you touch it, it might do something weird. <laughs> I just want to warn you. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if it will, but we've had that happen in the past. <laughs> so the biological assays uh, in these experimental groups confirms my happiness. Uh, hypothesis. I just want to show you. I use um, a chemistry method to measure co colony cross linking and content. So after hypoxia, both are increased. And then if I give the BAPN, then the increase is less because of the drug. And also the content is less. But look at the, the content in the mutant mice because of the, the, the degradation resistance. It remains high, so that in this way, I'm really uh, decoupling the changes in content and cross-linking. And then I would like to see what then what happens to the mechanical properties. Then I performed the uh, intact arterial force inflation test. So this is a vessel chamber I'm uh, using. And then under the microscope, this is how it looks like. It is mounted based on two glass cannulas. And then under the CCD camera, this is how the changes in the diameter is recorded. And then we can uh, inflate the artery either by static pressure or dynamic pressure that gives us the viscoelasticity. And then from there, we can obtain the pressure diameter relationship, and then we can convert it to stress strain relationship. And like I mentioned, if we apply the dynamic pressure, we can obtain the viscoelastic behavior. And one uh, character of a viscoelasticity of a material is that it is a frequency dependent. There is a frequency dependent behavior. So I just want to show you. So this is my artery. See, it's vibrating because this artery is inflated at 10 hertz of sinusoidal pressure. So in my experiments, I can alter the frequency from 0.01 hertz up to 20 hertz. So it gives us a really big range of 
frequency. And then from the pressure diameter change, it is dynamic, then we can obtain the loop like this, we call this to resistance loop. Um, and then from there, we can obtain two main parameters. One is the stiffness, which is the slope of this curve, of this loop, and then uh, another is called damping of the artery. It really it measures the energy that is being dissipated during a whole cycle. And then what, and again to remind you the changes in cross-linking and content we found before, then look at the stress-strain relationship. So after the hypoxia exposure, if the hypertension occurs, the strain, stress strain curve both moved, shift uh, leftward, that means it's stiffer. And if we give the drug, both in both strains, the, the left, leftward shift is becoming less. That means the drug is preventing the stiffening of the artery in both strains. And if you remember, this is the same trend as the collagen cross-linking. So that tells us it's the cross-linking, not the collagen content really affects the mechanical property. And then my uh, basal velocity measurement at 0.01 hertz also confirms a similar trend. So basically cross-linking prevents the increase. Uh, the drug, the BAP and treatment prevents the increase in both stiffness and the damping capacity. And then there's a correlation between cross-linking and Physical elastic uh, behavior. So it's consistent. So this is the major funding from that research. And I also want to mention that now, because these data are only from single frequency, and I mentioned, like I mentioned, uh, to further quantify physical elastic behavior, we really want to have a series of frequencies so that we can obtain a frequency dependent behavior. So because of that, and also because this pulmonary hypertension is really mild, the way I induce. So in order to study how the basal elasticity is changed during your pulmonary hypertension, so first I want to quantify the behavior in different multiple frequencies. And secondly, I want to look at it in a more severe disease. And so I'm using a, another model with hypoxia exposure and uh, injection with a drug that is a VEGF inhibitor. And then I just want to show the example of the pressure strain stretch curve in a normal artery. So this is at the lowest frequency, how the hysteresis loop is looking at. And then when we increase to one hertz, it's getting better. And then five hertz, 10 hertz, and 20 hertz. And you can see this pretty obvious frequency dependent behavior change in the normal arteries. And look at the diseased arteries. That's the, it's very different behavior than the control arteries. And then I further look at, remember we can quantify stiffness and damping from these curves. So look at, if we look at the stiffness, so the open square on the control arteries, there's at the lower frequencies, it's maintained constant, and then as the frequency increases, the stiffness increases. That's in the control artery, normal artery. And then in the disease artery, overall, all the dots of the solid squares are higher, that means it's stiffer. And furthermore, it's a different trend of frequency dependent. So that that I, that is the first funding of the frequency dependent changes in diseased artery. And if you look at the, uh, the stiffness at the tankers, that is the physiological uh, frequency of the mouse because mouse heart is beating faster. It's, our human hearts work at one hertz, our mouse heart works at 10 hertz. And if we look at this physiological frequency, then we can see the we can still see that diseased artery is having a stiffer artery than a control. And then we can also look at the damping capacity, which is the energy dissipation behavior. And then this time we see similar frequency dependent behavior that is as the frequency goes higher, the damping capacity increases. And when it's close to the physiological frequency, you can see that in the diseased arteries, generally the damping capacity is lower. 
That means it's dissipating less energy. What does it mean? It means the, the downstream artery or distal arteries are experiencing high positivity of pressure because it's unable to dissipate enough. And that will definitely have some consequence to the distal artery remodeling. So, and beyond those mechanical behavior changes, I also found it's correlated actually with ECM changes. For example, I look at the collagen content by histology and then I found that uh, there's an increase, significant increase in collagen amount and also proteoglycans amount. So these are the ECM protein changes between the control and the disease part. Okay, now I have talked about uh, the single artery mechanical property. I want to talk a little bit about how we can measure uh, the whole lung, whole pulmonary vasculature. And this measurement is called the measurement of pulmonary vascular impedance. So if we consider the heart is like a pump and the lungs or the, our vasculature is like a, a whole network of tubes, then the pump is really needs to um, overcome the, the resistance or impedance caused by the network of the vessels in order to provide constant pressure and flow to, the, to our body system. So normally it's very natural when we want to measure, okay, a single value of pressure, a single value of flow, and then the ratio of them is considered a resistance. But we know that it is only a static component. It is really in our inside our body, we are having all the time the dynamic changes over a cardiac cycle. For example, the pressure is not a single value, the flow is not. Therefore, if we obtain the dynamic pressure and flow information, and then we can obtain the, really the, uh, the uh, positive afterload of the positive uh, opposition of the vessel to the heart. So, and how can we do it? A very, um, this is also kind of a traditional method, is to, after we obtain the pressure and the flow, we can convert them into, uh, by Fourier transform, into frequency domain, and then the ratio of them can give us some information. And then we would obtain some graph like this. This tells us the, the modules, modules of the resistance, and this is the phase change. And then what is meaningful is at the zero hertz, that is what we call resistance. This is the steady opposition of the, of the vascular to the flow. And then at the higher frequencies, the average of these modulus is called, called compliance or characteristic impedance, ZC. That tells us the, um, the proximal stiffness and wave reflections. It, can, it includes more information. So. That means this measurement, it's a more comprehensive measurement of the arterial afterload to the heart compared to a single value of pressure overflow. And also, it has been found clinically that the pulmonary vascular impedance measurement is a better predictor of mortality than the xenon alone. So this is a, a powerful tool uh, from our mechanical point, engineer point of view but as you can imagine, the doctors would think it's too complicated. <laughs> so I'm trying, so that's why it's our job, trying to educate them and find critical parameters associated um, with the pulmonary vascular impedance so that we can tell them which one is, is a key parameter for diagnosis or uh, purposes, or prognosis purposes. And the measurement of the PVZ impedance uh, it can be split into in vivo and in vitro method. So this is the in vivo method established in my current group. So basically, uh, in the heart, we can insert a catheter into from, uh, from, the, from the right atrium to the right ventricle and then goes into the main pulmonary artery. And then this will obtain the pressure information. And then from the echo machine, the ultrasound, can measure the changes in the diameter. So 
in this way, we can, oh, I'm sorry, we can, the echo would give us a flow information, I'm sorry. So it is, from there, we can obtain the real-time pressure and flow, and then we can quantify the impedance. And currently, I'm using this method to study how the, uh, the different impact of proximal and distal mechanical changes <coughs> on the RB to model it. And I want to also mention another method is called in vitro measurement. So in this measurement, for example, if you take a mouse hard and long in this way, we can put two cannulas, a primary arterial cannula and left atrial cannula into the into each vessel, and then the animal is still in, um, ventilated by a, by a, a tube here. And then we can, the rest part is cut off. So, and then during this experiment, we can provide different type of flow. We can provide steady flow or positive flow at different frequencies. So that we monitor flow, we, uh, we can monitor the change the flow and record the flow, and now we can also record the pressure changes. So in this way, we can in vitro alter the, the dynamic uh, relationship between pressure and flow. And the advantage of an uh, in vitro system is that um, it is not complicated by the physiological factors, such as cardiac output or heart rate, because from the in vivo measure that would change, and that would also affect this relationship. So. Another, another advantage is that this system would allow us to test, again, the effects of vasoactive agents. So it's, I think it's a really useful, powerful tool to study pulmonary vascular physiology in different, different type of disease, not only vascular disease, also pulmonary diseases, such as pulmonary fibrosis. And lastly, I want to talk about how we can look at the heart. Um, and this is, again, uh, <coughs> a, a, a mature method to look at the whole organ function of the heart, that is by obtaining the in vivo pressure volume relationship from a heart chamber. For example, in this case, we, will, we can insert a catheter from the apex of the ventricle and then this catheter uh, would simultaneously obtain the pressure and volume information. And from there, we can obtain a, a graph like this, and the red lines are considered baseline loops. So that from there, we can obtain many um, useful para physiological parameters, such as cardiac output, stroke volume, those type of things, ejection fractions. And then, if we perform an occlusion in the in inferior vena cover, so we would place a ring here, and then we, if we close it temporarily, then that will reduce the loop, so it will create a series of loops like this, and from there we can obtain, if we join all the end systolic points of the loop, and then we can get a line, and from there we 